good afternoon again, everyone. I'm sick of sorry for sitting here in the sound of my voice, but thank you um, again for those who have stayed throughout the whole day. I know a lot of you have, most of you, um, and thanks for those who have just come for this lecture as well. Um, and my name is Tanya Hudson, Director of Development and Communications. So, uh, and again, and I'm sorry to repeat myself, but if we could just acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, Roger and my people and elders past, present and future. Um, this is our final lecture of our day lecture series um, in our first ever research week. So um, people like you are what we do this for and you're the, the reason that our clinicians and our researchers um, do the amazing work they do. So thank you all for, for coming and giving us your attention. Uh, Dr Angus Turner is one of our very talented doctors here at the Institute. He believes that all Western Australians should have access to excellent eye health care no matter where they live. He's the Macusker Director of Lions Outback Vision, which provides eye health services in WA's rural, remote and Indigenous communities. He's the current Western Australian of the Year in the professions category, was one of four WA finalists in the 2019 Australian of the Year, and he's a board member at the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Uh, he also is one of our more entrepreneurial um, doctors and he's, uh, that, that flair that he has is really driving the development of the new Northwest Hub up and growing. So uh, please welcome Dr. Angus Turner. Hello there. Thanks very much for having me today and especially for hanging around. If you've been here all day, that's quite a marathon. And um, I hope you can hang in there a bit longer. Um, my talk won't be too technical about the eye, so you don't have to look at too many graphs or special figures, and um, maybe you can have a little nap if you at that stage of the day. I, I won't be offended. Um, so thanks for um, today's research week. I've, I've got an opportunity to talk to you a bit about what we're doing in the outreach, and connected to that, there are quite a few research projects, but I'm not going to go into each little one. I'm just going to discuss a bit more broadly what we're trying to do um, in the remote areas in particular, and for many people um, who live out there, many Aboriginal people, um, all sorts of uh, people have chosen to make their home far away from our big city, um, and providing access to care that's the same as the city is a real challenge. Um, so it's all been uh, an interesting history because Ida Mann was an ophthalmologist from Oxford, um, and she actually was the first professor of any discipline uh, at Oxford University as a woman and she then came out to Perth. Uh, her husband was unwell and he needed a warmer climate for his uh, ailment and they ended up in Perth and soon enough she rolled up her sleeves and got up north and did amazing work um, looking into the uh, condition of uh, um, the eyes for Aboriginal people. Um, so she really got the ball rolling in this state and one of her friends um, from London days uh, was this uh, man, Father Frank Flynn, and he was an ophthalmologist from Australia who had gone to do some training in London and ended up um, deciding to become a priest. And then once he went up on his first job to Darwin, there were lots of eye things to sort out as well. So he spent 50 years um, also working in eyes in Darwin. Um, then, of course, in 1990, um, Fred Hollows was made Australian of the Year, which actually um, recognised his work for uh, garnering the interest of many ophthalmologists and doing a big survey around Australia in the 80s. Um, and as an Australian of the Year, he then brought to the public consciousness what is uh, an ophthalmologist, what's eye surgery. And so it's really been an amazing legacy for the general public to know about eyes and the things you can do to help people see again. Um, and so here at the Lions Eye Institute, only 30 years old, um, but Ian Constable, um, who started this place, and um, many of the colleagues of his have worked in remote areas as well. And uh, the pictures that you'll see in our history um, book of the um, Lions Clubs getting together to support the glaucoma screening ban. Um, and many people had their eyes checked by that ban, and we'll come to mobile clinics in a moment. Here's a picture of Ian, and um, here's our big state. So this is um, a huge state, as you can see. It's got two and a half million square kilometers and two and a half million people. But most of those people live right here. Um, and it's actually the biggest land subdivision in the world, uh, part of Siberia. So it certainly um, needs to, um, be, some new ideas need to be thought through to get to everyone for their eye care. 
That's what it feels like sometimes. Uh, yeah, it's like fell up. And so there's some long open roads, as you would know, and some of the colours and some of the scenery are spectacular, um, but it does make um, the access to the eye care difficult. Um, there's been a program for screening of diabetes for many years, and that started off with Polaroid film, and the photos were sent down to Perth and graded. Um, and then there was a transition to all the digital cameras, as you can appreciate, and that was actually quite tricky because um, just getting these photos to us and organising them was difficult at first, um, but that's been in place for a long time. And the reason we screen for diabetes, I won't go into too much, but you heard quite a bit of that in the last talk. Um, the things that can creep into your eye and your kidneys and your feet, your whole body actually, um, that you can screen for and prevent vision loss. That's the goal. One of the problems we had though is that when we found something like diabetes, we couldn't really treat it to the same standard as the city because of fancy equipment that kept coming along. In the last decade or so, the technology, just like the rest of life, seems to have taken off. And the way we can image the eye and some of the treatments that are available were not accessible. And you can't fly patients down to Perth all the time. And at the same um, level, you can't say, oh, you live in the bush, so we can't really give you the proper treatment. Um, so when you added up all the different toys that the ophthalmologists use, and I'm sure some of you have seen them in, in the Lions Eye Institute, you'd need about half a million dollars worth of kit in 20 different locations. And you can't really ask the government for that sort of upgrade, especially when you're only visiting once in a while and it's sitting in the broom cupboard most of the time. So we needed to come up with this solution of a vision van full of all the gear that we need. And amazingly, this gets all around the state uh, with a team and is able to provide the same level of access. But it is a big state, like I've mentioned already, and getting around this state frequently enough is still a challenge. It's also got fragile gear and the big highways and roads are fine, but the, the dirt roads are certainly not ideal. Um, yet, luckily as a mining state, we have some pretty good roads up there if you can dodge the road trains. This was actually our first trip. We turned up in Kalgoorlie after dark and these patient ladies were waiting for us. Uh, they had flown in from the NG lands to, to, to receive treatment surgery the next day. Um, so it's incredible amount of logistics and coordination you can imagine. There's a lot more than just driving a truck around. There's um, coordinating with all the communities where on earth to park this huge thing. Um, that is bigger than a normal van when people are trying to picture it. So I thought I'd discuss um, something else that happened um, over the last few years, and that's the thing called the OCT. It's the scanner that shows your eye's uh, retina in three dimensions, so that we used to look at a photograph and say in two dimensions, that's a picture, you can see what's happening, but we really needed to know what, how thick the retina was, how much leakage there was. So if you heard Hassan's talk earlier, it was about that leakage in the macula. And a new machine came along, which has actually been quite fancy and easy to um, use, is this OCT. And you touch a button, drives in, takes a picture of the eye. So we tested that as, was it any better for screening? And in the context of an Aboriginal health clinic, it really didn't actually add a lot because um, there were some other challenges to using it. And essentially, at that time, in the real world practice, it didn't make a big difference. So I'll talk a little bit about that OCT in a minute. I'll come back to it, because we did that study and said there wasn't much difference, but we've come back to it um, for a reason I'll come to in a moment. This is um, a nice glossy picture, doesn't always look exactly like this because we don't actually use those earbuds, but at the time it seemed like a nice prop. But we talked to the patients about their eye condition via the internet or on a video. And the reason for that is this patient, for example, Mavis, is in Jigalong. I don't know if anyone's been to Jigalong. It's choir. There you are. Professor Mackey's been to Jigalong. Um, it's quite a long dirt road to get there, and it's um, far from Newman, and then it's far from Headland. And by the time you get that patient to surgery, um, it's a bit of a, an epic journey. Now, for someone like Mavis, um, the traditional way these things work is your doctor writes a letter and says, so-and-so has been seen, um, they've got a cataract, can you see them? And four months later, the specialist comes to Headland, 
but that patient has to come all the way there to be seen in a very busy clinic because you've only got a few days in each different town. And you look in the eye and say, yes, you've got a cataract and go on the wait list and it's about a year. So you can imagine Mavis goes all the way back to Jigalong and says they did nothing for my eye. I don't even know what happened because it was such a rush and no one really explained it to me. Um, and a year or so later on the wait list, they come to Heaven, they don't, they don't actually make it to Heaven. And I wouldn't blame a person for saying, well, last time you did nothing. Um, so what's really fantastic now is with all these pictures and cameras, the optometrist goes to Jigalong and the optometrist has all the skills for driving a slit lamp looking in the eye and telling us what's happening, and then sets up the conversation with the specialist on the internet. And so we can bypass that first appointment and the second and the third, all the checkups can be bypassed. And when they turn up, they just get what they need, which is the surgery. So when Mavis did come to Headland, not only was the wait list much shorter, but she had her surgery and she was very happy first time I actually met her. And then she can have the treatment which is a big cataract, which has made both eyes blind. So she went home seeing for the first time in a very long time. She hadn't actually seen her grandchildren before. So I think what this is saying is that the, the use of telehealth really does have a role for eyes because the, the photos of the eye tell us so much. Um, but the optometrists are very well placed to do that. So quite a lot of our lobbying and efforts have been to recognise optometrists as being our key team players in the outback work. And when you're short on numbers, and if you look at the numbers, there should be 10 full-time ophthalmologists living in the country areas now to match the city, but we're not gonna just find 10 ophthalmologists. So you need to really work together as a team. And it would actually be lovely if our public hospitals in Perth had this arrangement, I reckon, because there's a long wait for surgery no matter where you go from Sydney to Perth. But maybe we'll get it right in the bush first and then we'll bring it to the city, go that way around. So this photo is the back of the eye. You've seen some pictures like this today, it's the retina. And if you have a cataract, um, you could say, oh, I'll get rid of the cataract and you'll see better. But in this case, there's actually some swelling in that retina. This OCT shows the swelling. So it's not the whole problem um, to just take out a cataract. And that's why the telehealth is so good these days because I can confidently operate on someone's eye um, and do for many, many patients knowing that the retina is actually healthy. Uh, and that's been a big change in why telehealth's going well. The problem is that OCT machine I showed you before is very big, it weighs over 25 kilos, costs a lot of money, and you can't really carry them in a small plane. And essentially we needed to make it smaller so this, the great thing about being in the Perkins, in this building, is that you're working around lots of very clever people, uh, much cleverer than I could imagine when it comes to building things and inventing things. And in the coffee queue, I met engineers who were working on the light of the eye and the thing called OCT for the skin and for breast biopsy. But in conversation, it turned out they know how to make a very small OCT which means if you take that idea and bring it to the eye, maybe we could carry it around. So we um, were able to work on a, this thing, which you can see is a sort of interesting looking gadget, which was the idea of getting the OCT into a backpack. So the first project was to bring the fancy big fat machine, which is very expensive and heavy, into a little backpack that you could carry to the, to the bush with you. And this prototype, worked well and took a beautiful photograph. I'll just go back to it. You can see in the top left, that shows all the layers of the retina, just like we hoped. But um, I guess by the time you get this looking, this machine into something that someone can buy, it's a lot of uh, red tape, more than red tape, a lot of good experiments as well. You've got to get it approved and tested and checked. And the goal of this is to make it really cheap so anyone in the developing world can buy one because OCT is not very accessible. And so I thought, well, there's no point doing this because technology moves very fast and we really have to jump to the next level, which is taking a big computer and sticking it in your pocket as a mobile phone required you to get onto a little chip, silicon chip. And that technology is actually possible because I found another guy in this building who knows how to get big computers onto little chips. 
So he's working with us now together to get it onto the telephone, onto the mobile phone. And that will be a real game changer. So you might as well jump to something that's actually going to make a big difference and not get bogged down um, in the me meantime. So we're working on this project, which, which is good fun, and hopefully we'll have real impact for countries that can't afford the OCT. It's very relevant, this problem, because you know patients, you can get really fancy with your treatment and your technology, but if the patients don't know that they need an eye check, you're not going to get very far. So sometimes you have to step back from all the exciting technology and say, oh, we, we better just make sure our patients understand what's happening and actually want to get their eye checked. So this is a few weeks ago now, this patient's um, eye was sent from the telehealth system. And this poor guy um, is actually only uh, 31 and he's already blind in both eyes. And it's a bit hard to tell, but there's all sorts of strange red squiggly vessels on that nerve, and that is showing that he's at great risk of having a bleed in the eye and losing all his vision. And he needs a lot of treatment, but he lives in a town called Bijidanga. And what we're really hoping is, is for two things. One is patients with diabetes to know that it's a good idea to get your eye check. But when I explain to this um, gentleman that he needs to come to Perth quite urgently, a quick chat on the internet is not going to make him necessarily understand um, you know, through that medium. So we have to think of ways to encourage an appreciation of the importance of this. And also, um, secondarily as well, think about all his family and friends who need to get some education in the schools about diabetes and food and that sort of thing. So we have a program called Love Food, which goes into the schools to uh, educate patients relating to the eyeball, but thinking about diet and it's actually quite an effective um, tool. Now, I'm not quite sure if this will work because I just snuck it on minutes before the talk, but we have some health workers in Derby and Fitzroy Crossing who helped us make this little video, and I'll just show you because the um, AV here is good enough, I think. mistake I just made. Sorry about that. Here we go. Oh, I'll just skip it to there. So that's just the start, it's a couple more minutes explaining what to do about the eyes and it captures people and their um, concepts that will really help connect your eyes to what you're seeing and um, what this disease is doing. And uh, the student that helped make that was a clever um, guy who was one of our uh, research students for the year um, and he then improved his cartoon drawing skills because he quite enjoyed it uh, and running through the narrations with the health workers and he came up with this Next one, I'll show you just a minute of this, which is to explain to the patient when they need some treatment. Because when you shoot a laser into someone's eye, it's quite a hard concept to explain what you're doing. And um, with the laser, you're not really trying to uh, improve the vision, you're just trying to prevent a problem. And you can actually also make the vision a bit worse now to prevent the problem later. So that's actually quite a difficult consent. Your patient walks out saying, the laser made me blind, is not a great thing for the community to um, 
talk about. <laughs> so this little video helps quite a lot. Done it again. There we go. Now, let's try this. <laughs> And it really just connects to the patient and, and says, don't be too scared about this, um, and has made a big difference. And I'd love to work on a few more of these because they really connect the telehealth to something tangible and um, reassure patients. This is one of the patients I bumped into at a roadhouse on the way. Um, I didn't realize I'd see him there, but he had missed his post-op check, so it was a good chance to see what he was uh, seeing. Um, so we, we have um, talked about this van, and this little picture is trying to show some ideas for the future, um, but they're quite in a near future now, um, because the van can't get around our state quick enough to treat diabetes, um, and we need to get around the Midwest wheat belt and gold fields more frequently. And in order to serve the Northwest properly, um, there are 100,000 people up there, so there should be three ophthalmologists, um, but they're none. And we spend all our time running around in a flurry and overwhelming the local health clinics by turning up and saying, we've got 60 people see today. And, you know, big push at the operating theater and everyone feels stressed when we turn up. Um, and fortunately the patients, um, you know, get a great service and it's all hanging in there by, um, uh, by tooth, what's the, what's the term? Hanging in there by our throat, <laughs> that's it. Um, so what we're gonna do is um, start a little regional hub and it's starting off as a little regional hub but it's actually um, in a beautiful backpackers that's been donated and um, in a week or two it'll be announced um, all about this because the donor has kindly given us some land and buildings to get started um, and other people have been generous to give us some fancy equipment so it'll be up to scratch um, in the back corner of the backpackers for next year. And then we've got to really think what to do about the rest of the backpackers because if you only think about the eyeball um, in the community like Broome, where this is going to be based, um, you're kind of missing all the other connected bits. Um, and it's fine at the Lions Eye Institute in Perth to really just think about the eyeball, but in a remote setting, we've got ample opportunity to work together when it comes to kidney doctors and foot checks and allied health. And then the patient can turn up who's a diabetic and really have a, a, a sort of holistic care, which would be fantastic. And this backpack is a few hundred metres from the airport, um, right in the middle of town. And we hope from that base we'll be able to get from Karatha all the way to Kananara um, as little trips every month so that patients can be seen at the right frequency. So um, where is this going to plan? We've still got some nudging and lobbying to do to try and encourage the state government and the federal government to get on board. Um, the Labour government did make an election promise, but they didn't make it too far through the last election. So we are um, going to keep working with the current government who are very interested in what we could do. And um, in the meantime, we're rattling lots of cans to um, raise money for this project. Um, so exciting times ahead. and. That will certainly enable the state to get much better coverage. And then we're going to keep working on the big things, which are ensuring there's a future workforce um, and that patients will have adequate care. So this 
Broome Hub will be able to train ophthalmologists. Um, it will have um, the capacity to have a registrar going through their training there. And it will also have the capacity to really boost the Aboriginal health workers who are absolutely key for the screening programs. So if you don't have a great screening program throughout the communities, then those who reach the specialist are um, you know, lucky ones to get there. The screening program with the optometrist as well needs to be strong. So lots of aspects to um, consider. And um, if any of you taking a caravan around our state and have an injection here at the Lions Eye Institute sometimes, and we can do them for you in Broome on the way, that would be quite a good pit stop. And uh, here's some of our team, Kerry and Rana with our van, which is a great thing to work on and we're very fortunate to have this um, donated um, to the Lions Eye Institute to be able to do the work. And many other donors have really helped get this program off the road, on the road, and I, I thank you for listening today and any questions, you're very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Turner. That was very inspiring. The work of Lions at that vision and some of the team are here today as well is um, is nothing short of, of incredible. The reach that they do and the, the remote places that they get to to deliver eye health care is quite quite incredible. So Angus is very happy to take questions. Um, has anyone got any? Okay, maybe repeat this. That's a great question, actually. The question is linking in with the Royal Flying Doctors base. That's really the last piece of the puzzle for this um, Broom Hub, is how to, how to fly to all these um, places um, from Broom. And um, I'm involved in the Royal Flying Doctors service, but it is, at the moment, very fancy airplanes taking incredibly sick people, like an ICU, like a special hospital, to where they need care. It doesn't do very much taking a healthy team of health staff, doctors and nurses and optometrists, to the town. It's a bit of an expensive me method at the moment, but I know that the RFDS is keen to tackle this. Um, in the interim, we are um, using small aeroplanes um, and uh, always trying to work out ways to keep the cost down and the environmental effects down as well. So the big truck was a combination of donors. Um, it was Lottery West contributed, and the uh, state government contributed to the annual operational costs. It's 400,000 a year from the state government and some support from Fred Hollows has come as well, another 100,000. And also um, the initial truck was $2 million. That was Lottery West and a contribution from the federal government as well. Yeah. So lots of um, big efforts and the, the Broom Hub um, has a, a list of donors that's growing and there'll be more about that in the news, I hope, so that they can get recognised very well. Um, and it all takes a lot of engineering work here. I see some of our team actually from Outback Vision sitting there and um, the phones run hot and patients, when they call for an appointment, it's never simple. It's um, where do you normally live? What's your current contact detail? How am I going to get hold of you next time? And we're only there for a couple of days, so where can you see next time? So there's a lot of extra work. It's like a radio controlled tower sometimes. What is the cost of the van per year? The van per year costs 500,000, um, which actually for the state government, when they look at all their services, cannot believe how we do it so efficiently. Because we, we travel 25,000 kilometers with a team of people having to be accommodated, driven, flown, and we see all those patients. Um, so, you know, 3,000 patients on the van plus all the telehealth that's happening. We started with one driver, but it was a pretty tough road, and after two years, I realised we definitely needed two. In fact, every well essentially has two, at least, um, to tag team, um, and it works well that way. Yeah, so... Um, the van we need to keep going, so um, it's got a lot of work to do figuring out its new path once, once it can be let off the hook from the very far north. Um, so next year it will continue through those towns just in case this hub is taking a while to get going um, because we're pushing the builders and pushing everyone to get started and fed. But it's wet season coming up, so we'll see how it all goes.
Yes, the Dampier Peninsula. Yeah. That's right, is it? If anyone's tried that road, it's um, still dirt, but it's being worked on. So, um, yeah, we've got a few patients who would prefer not to see an eye doctor than drive on that road. So we'll go through, we'll better go to them. Yes. Can do, yeah. And also, um, it'll bring a tourist boom because it's absolutely stunning. So we'll see how um, that road goes. Yes. Right, well, we're really hoping being in Broome talking about school students, um, that there's a chance finally to go and test um, kids at schools. Um, strangely, um, it seems that Aboriginal kids have the best vision in the world, um, and yet later in life it's obviously got some real challenges when it comes to diabetes and all sorts of conditions. So what we're hoping is to actually, being resident in the Kimberley, um, is get community uh, interest and see if they would like um, to have a study started to try and work out why is your vision, you're not the best vision in the world. Um, and one thing that's interesting is that when you look with a computer and analyse the photo, uh, we can see all sorts of things now that well, actually we as humans can't see. So it's a bit strange, but you can work out if someone's a man or a woman from their eye photo. You can work out uh, their age very closely and all sorts of other factors in the eye because you can see the arteries and veins, which are part of the heart, and you can see the nerve from the brain, the brain tissue coming in. And it's turning out that the artificial intelligence, you might have heard that word for lots of other parts of life, is incredibly effective when it comes to pictures of the back of the eye. So one of the research projects which I didn't get into in the, in the talk was those OCT machines have a wealth of information that if you strip away who's who, the names and the information about the people, uh, the computers are telling us things about disease that we've never been able to work out. And so we've teamed up with Google and we've teamed up with uh, a group in Melbourne that does similar work. And we are um, sending all of these pictures into a big computer and discovering things. And what would be great is to start with six-year-olds in the school and check um, as they progress through life every time they come for a checkup what these amazing photos can show us about how excellent vision can be um, and perhaps some of the triggers that make it um, get worse later. So that's an exciting research project. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. Big changes. Yeah. Yeah, Western diet is a, a, a very sort of short term change for many. Certainly will. That's absolutely true. And my wife's actually a chef and a teacher and gets his, um, actually not her teeth stuck in, but she gets um, stuck into all the food education. And once we're in Broome, we're going to um, connect up with the nutritionists and food education to do exactly that. Good suggestion. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. And I must say, we all sit in the office here and look at pictures like that and get madly jealous. However, the Lines Up Vision team, you know, works incredibly hard, so they do get to enjoy our beautiful state, but um, there's a lot, of, a lot of hard work there as well. So thank you again. Um, all of you, thank you so much for being part of our lecture series. Um, I hope you found it informative and compelling. Um, I certainly learned a whole lot of new things today um, listening to all the lectures. So. 
Thank you again for giving up your Tuesday, and we hope to see more of our events. Thank you very much.